good afternoon to you all sports fans. It's your boys from Table 5, courtesy of the Sports Bar. My man Stacy Porter providing the action. Me and my man Adam providing the transaction. My man Adam, who needs no introduction, how are you today, my man? How are you today? It's Wednesday, oh, hump good. day. Hump day. It's the middle of the week. Ah. Yeah, yeah, doing pretty good. You know, I got actually today and tomorrow off, so, uh, you know, I work five days straight, so, you know, time for me to get some rest a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I hear it. Slavery is a rough business. But uh, anyway, man, let's get right into it. We got Marion this week, U.S. Open. Talk a little bit of Tiger Woods first right off the top. Um, I don't think – I don't know if he can get this one. And I, the reason I say that is just because um, – this is a tough course, man. I've been watching some of the updates on this course, tough course, short course, but it's um, it's real tough, deep, um, deep rough, bunkers, all that. I mean, you know, even to the casual observer, once they started sort of tiger-proofing these, these, uh, these um, golf courses, and we talked about it before, once they started kind of tiger-proofing these golf courses, that was kind of pretty much it for Tiger Woods. That's just my opinion um, in the sense that we don't see, like, how great LeBron is or how high he can jump. And so we say, okay, let's go ahead and raise the rim 11 inches. Or, you know, to, let's raise the rim to, to 11 feet. You know, we don't see Kobe Bryant with five rings, and we say, okay, well, let's let's make the playoffs longer so you have to work harder to get a ring. They've literally changed the game for this dude, which I really think is kind of whack. Because when you look at Jack Nicholas and you say, oh, Tiger's never going to catch uh, uh, Jack Nicholas's uh, major record, which is, you know, all of a sudden the only thing everybody cares about. First it was wins. You know, now he's he's about to surpass, you know, he's already surpassed Jack, and he's second most in the wins. Oh, now it's majors again. So, you know, you, you, you know how it is. Keep moving the goalposts the more you accomplish. Anyway, um, but they started t- sort of tiger-proofing these, um, these stadiums, I mean, these, these golf courses, and it's kind of weird because it's like, wow, you know, who can win here? You know, Phil Mickelson has basically become a joke. He was supposed to be the one that was supposed to be challenge Tiger. He's never done it. Sergio, you know what he's going through. He was supposed to challenge Tiger. He's never done it. He never became the next Tiger. Um, they got him paired up with Roy, Roy McIlroy, who is the you know the Irish cat that I told you. He hasn't won. So you know you kind of you kind of pricing yourself out of your own market, so to speak, when you when you Tiger these stadiums or these courses, and then nobody is really a consistent winner. You know, it's somebody different all the time, which in theory you would think is good for your sport. Just Again, just my opinion. You would think in theory, yeah, everybody else has an opportunity, everybody else wins, but we all know golf is an individual sport, and you need a king of the mountain. You need a king of the hill. If you do not have a king of the hill, it sort of becomes sort of sort of mundane. Like nobody's going to watch it. It's sort of like, oh, hum, oh, somebody from Australia won it, oh, whatever. But if Tiger Woods wins it a couple of times in a row, or even Phil Mickelson, you're like, damn, Phil is dominating. You know, who's going to knock him off? And then it'll start you, it'll get you watching, you know. So, you know, speaking of which, uh, you know, the Miami Heat, <laughs> talk, speaking of King of the Hill, um, drop one last night, man. Your thoughts? Yeah, it's kind of a odd series. I mean, uh, you know, game one, was, you know, pretty pretty close. Miami was in control of the game. San Antonio was able to make a run fourth quarter and uh, won by four points. So he was like, okay, that's solid game one. You know, both sides, you know, probably had opportunities to win the game. San Antonio capitalized. Then, you know, Miami just comes out and hammers them, you know, game two, uh, which was, uh, you know, pretty surprising. Pretty surprising in the, you know, you know, get hammered like that in game game two. Then you come back, you know, Spurs at home, you know, figure, you know, home crowd might make up for something, but they just, you know, their bench just all of a sudden becomes, you know, the greatest shooting team in, in the league, you know, Danny Green and, you know, well, really it was Gary Neal off the bench. 
But, yeah, Danny Green, Kawhi Leonard, those guys just couldn't miss. Well, I mean, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, and again, this is this is this is what's got me curious, though. When you when you look at what San Antonio was able to put together yesterday, and we're talking about sixty plus points from three guys that you can't really tell me where they went to school. You really can't tell me a whole lot about the guys. Um, when you look at these guys, and you say to yourself. Did it really beat Miami, or did they just outshoot Miami? And when I say they outshot Miami, look, how how far is the three-point line right now? Just just for our listeners out there, you tell me, Adam. How far is the three-point line now? Isn't it uh, twenty-four feet? 20. At the top, at the top of the key, it's about nineteen feet. Is that right? No, no, I thought it was 24, 25 feet. Not all the way around. It's not 25 feet. It's it's in the neighborhood. We'll look that one up because I, I you know, the, wind- the, corners the, the corners is the shortest three pointers, the two corners, right and left. But The yeah. corners are what? They're under 20 feet. They're under they're under 20 feet. I know that. What, my, my point is simply this. My point is simply this, and we'll we'll put that out to the trivia question, folks, later. Easy answer. I'm sure we could figure it out in a second. Just got so much other information floating around in my head that sometimes it slips my mind. The point is, is that the three-point line has been moved in, and it's become a three-point shooting contest. And it's almost like you live by the three, you die by the three. Charles Barkley says it all the time. But what's interesting about that is, is that if you see threes that are falling, it's almost as if you don't even really see guys trying. And so I think this is where Miami kind of gave up the ghost yesterday in that loss. So I don't think they got beat as much as they got outshot. But there were so many points being scored that Miami, instead of sticking, dancing with who brought you and sticking to their game mode, they went into this sort of let's try to fire and compete with people. LeBron's shot was not falling. There came a point where Jeff Van Gundy even said in the game, he said, look, they're daring you to shoot, go ahead and shoot. And LeBron scored seven points before they could even blink. Take it to the rack. I mean, I'm tired of hearing about the big three. I'm tired of hearing about, you know, they're built to win championship. This team is nowhere near built to win a damn championship. You're getting nothing from Dwayne Wade. You're getting nothing from Chris Bosh. Dwayne Wade, again, the funny thing about him is, is when I say uh, LeBron went to Miami and didn't get anybody, everybody says, well, wait a minute, Dwayne Wade's great. Dwayne Wade has a championship. Dwayne Wade this. But when I say, wow, really? Dwayne Wade only scored 16 points last night on 15 shots. Then everybody goes, well, he's been injured. Well, Injury be damned. Grant Hill is a Hall of Famer without injuries. I mean, you you, you understand what I'm saying? I mean, it's, it, you can't, to me, it's like you can't place this artificial value on Dwayne Wade as it pertains to LeBron in the sense that you can't say I'm valuable because you can't say that there's no value behind what LeBron is doing because he joined these two other superstars. But then when I tell you he's getting nothing or less than nothing from these superstars, you can't turn around and say, oh, they're injured. You can't do that. You can't have it both ways. If you're going to give him credit when they win, then you've got to give him blame when they lose. And, again, I'm, no, I'm not criticizing Dwayne Wade. Do I think he's one of the most overrated players in the NBA in the last 10 years? Absolutely. His first ring came on the back of a bunch of hungry veterans and some really good play by him, but poorly called series. You know, Dallas basically gave up and fell apart. 
um, a lot of factors swung their way. There was, no, there was absolutely no dominance. You know how there was no dominance with that team? You know how you know that Miami team wasn't dominant? Because the very next year, they get swept in the first round. Full strength. They lost a few players, James Posey, a couple of heads here and there. But that team full strength, with Shaquille O'Neal, they get swept in the first round the very next year. So I don't want to hear about from people how great Dwayne Wade is, how this and that and the other, and LeBron took the easy way out by joining these guys. Chris Bosh has given them nothing. And I, I used to like Chris Bosh. I really did. I thought Chris Bosh was a franchise cornerstone type player in Toronto, a guy that you could actually build around. If that guy had any type of a big man around him, that guy would have been sick. Uh, to me, he was uh, he seemed hungrier. He seemed more determined to uh, show all of his skills, you know, not just rely on his jump shooting. I mean, I know, uh, you know, he had the ball in his hand a little bit more. That probably is why he was so aggressive as far as, you know, um, you know, uh, going to the basket first and then going to the jumper, you know. And now, you know, he doesn't have the ball in his hand as much because, you know, um, you know, Wade and LeBron, they, they handle the ball so much. But I don't know, man. He just – he needs to get back to being versatile and, and – you know, even if he – he's never going to be a, a back-to-the-basket player, but, you know, instead of selling for the jumper, hey, fourth drive and try to go to the basket. Maybe you draw a foul, get to the free throw line, get into some type of rhythm, and then they back off you a little bit, and then, hey, the jumper is even more open, you know. And, you know, I just, I just think that's what he needs to get back to doing. I really feel like and, – and, and I concur with that. I, I totally 100% do because a guy I, – I hate a big man that turns into a jump shooter. I hate a jump shooting big man. I really do. I mean, there, there's one exception, and that's Dirk Nowitzki because he's just so absolutely lights out that you can't hate. But when Pau Gasol started doing it, I hated it. I hated it. A, a big man that settles for jump shots because you're supposed to throw your weight around. You're supposed to have moves in the post. That That's your game. But um, – I agree that, you know, but, but in the case of the difference between him and Powell, obviously, is that Powell already had the championships. Powell already was a dominant. We know Powell is sort of on preservation mode, and that's why he's settling for jump shots. So Powell in that is the past because he's trying to prolong his career. So I, I get it with him. But I don't understand it. You were so incredibly dominant in Toronto that they could have built a around it. And you get here, and there's just absolutely nothing there. Um, that said, I don't think that the pieces that can be valuable um, – John, John, you still there? John. Hmm, sounds like the guys were having technical difficulties. This is what happens when we don't pay a cell phone bill on time. <laughs> I'm joking. Yeah, we have some technical difficulties. And you know what, listeners? If you like the show, you can check them out at stacysports.com. Now, let's get back to the show. A little bit of technical difficulty, but we'll work through it. We'll work through it. Um, the gripe that I'm hearing that I, I obviously disagree with is the whole um, – am I coming in clear? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Adam, check one, two. Yes, okay. The, the, the difficulty that I'm having is, is I'm hearing this LeBron should and could do more argument. He can't win. Because if he goes out there and drops 45 and they lose, he's a ball hog. Dwayne Wade's bitching and moaning. Me, Chris and I don't get enough touches. Chris and I don't get enough opportunities. If he goes out there 12 points and they lose, it's, he should have done more to help his team. 
he should have been more like Michael Jordan instead of Magic Johnson. But here's the thing. When they won the other night, and what did he have, 13, 14 points, and it was a blowout, nobody really said anything about him. So it only seems to become convenient to blame LeBron when they lose. Here's the problem I really, really have with that. They have a formula in Miami, which is LeBron is the facilitator. We all know that. He facilitates. So we know what he's going to start off doing with the team. His jump shot wasn't falling yesterday. No big deal because it wasn't as if uh, San Antonio was beating them. They were just hitting a bunch of threes. So that formula can work. Here's what people don't understand. Most of Mike's, Michael Jordan I'm talking about, high scoring, going crazy, going off games, he lost. You can look it up. That's just statistical fact. Most of Jordan's high point scoring games, he lost. 50, 60 points here, 63 points in a loss to Boston. Because you can't win with one guy shouldering that kind of responsibility in the finals. Especially in a pressure-packed playoff type of situation like this. I just don't like, first of all, how Dwayne Wade is getting the pass. Chris Bosh is not even, we're not even talking about him at all because I guess the media doesn't think it's sexy enough to talk about a guy who's giving you nothing, but yet he's still making $100 million. He's still got the $100 million contract. Me and you talked about that yesterday where they're shopping him, possibly. And it would be a good idea for them to shop him. Because to me, honestly, I think that big three era crap is dead. And I hope it is. I really do. I really hope it is. Because you see with Boston, yeah, they got a ring. That's all they got. They got a ring. That big three crap, man, it needs to go somewhere. They need to put that stuff out the past. Well, I think, uh, you know, the new CBA, uh, this is probably the last time you'll see, you know, three guys like this get together because the new CBA, they're trying to make it, you know, more of a competitive balance type deal. But, you know, we'll see how it, you know, works out. Absolutely. Because, because to me, you need more. You, San Antonio is showing you that you need more role players to step up. Again, my case was validated again yesterday with Tim Duncan. I don't even want to hear Tim Duncan is one of the best big men we've ever seen. I don't even want to hear that. Again, I know Spurs fan, you will hate on me. I'm sorry. I'm not trying to sound like ESPN. I'm not trying to hate on the dude. But the last two championships, if I'm not mistaken, was Tim Duncan the MVP in either one of them? Uh, the, uh, he was there oh three. But uh, 07 right. Park it was, yeah. Right. And Ginobili was one of their finals MVP. Am I correct in that? No, no. Okay. So Tim, Tim, Tim has two. Tim has two. Tim has two. Wait, who, was their first, who was their first finals MVP? Was it Dave Robinson? Right. Tim has two. Tim has two. Parker has one. Parker has one. I'm not trying to take anything away from Tim Duncan. The only thing I'm saying is, is your franchise has carried you, homie. Your franchise has carried Tim. I have never seen Tim Duncan put this franchise within the last, I want to say, 10 years, put this franchise on his back and carry this franchise. I have never seen it. Last night he had 12. Yeah, he had the four rebounds. But when you're playing against a team that don't even have a big man and you're a seven-footer, you better damn well have 14 rebounds. But that 14 rebounds virtually meant nothing when you have two guys that are shooting the lights out. Those 14 rebounds didn't mean anything. They were, they were not critical to the mission, and he only had 12 points. I think they can win without Tony Parker. Tony Parker's got a hamstring injury. I think they can win without Tony Parker. They showed it yesterday. They don't need him to... to to be uh, to score a lot of points. Now they probably need him to facilitate and be that floor general. But I think you can win nowadays today without your floor general. 
I do. I think you can win without a floor general. I think you can win with with um, just a bunch of guys who are scrappy, who hustle. Kawhi Leonard is a beast, man. That guy is averaging a double double in this series, eleven and twelve. For a guy you never heard of from San Diego State, what what basketball players? First of all, it's a football school. What basketball players do you hear come out and just are beast mode from a football school? It's rare. That guy is averaging 11 and 12 in the, in the finals. Neil, Green, I mean, it's just, man, they, they're too much. That's why I said the beginning of the season, day one, the Dwight Howard incident didn't, it didn't have any bearing on my pick because I knew that if San Antonio came out of the web, in fact, the only thing that really validated my uh, – the only thing that really validated my um, or sort of sealed it for me to say that San Antonio would win the championship was when Russell Westbrook went down. Because once Russell Westbrook went down, you knew Oklahoma City didn't have a chance. You knew that. That was that was a wrap. And so, um, you know, San Antonio, you know, my faith wasn't even shaken when they played Golden State because – Although Golden State did have the opportunity and the ability to knock them out, you still could you still could never count them out until you've seen it go in. Who's that? Who's who, who stepped in? Adam. Say again. Say again. Say, my, my... Say again. Yeah, my phone, uh, my phone cut off. That's what I just got back. Well, you boy, I tell you, you got we we both got phone. So much for so much for satellites, huh? But anyway, my my point basically was this. My point basically was this, and I, I know you could hear it. Uh, most of what was being said got the, got the gist of what I was saying. The point was is that you could never count San Antonio out until the final bell, and once Golden State failed to put them out, you knew it was all pretty much downhill from there. Um, I just don't think Miami has enough firepower. I don't think they have enough gas in the tank. And let's face it, um, I don't think the monkey is off on LeBron's back. From a standpoint of he's validated the criticisms because he won a championship, I will say that. But when you have people still trying to play the not one, not two, not three, when you have people play, still trying to play that crap instead of saying, well, he still has to have help, he's not going to win five championships or even three with Dwayne Wade and Chris Bosh. I said that going in. That was my first thought when he got to, to Miami. I said they're going to win one at best. They're going to win one championship at best. Maybe, maybe two. Maybe two. And this is their third trip to the finals. They ain't winning this final. Just I'm sorry to bust your bubble, Miami fan. They're not winning this series. It's not going to happen. I'm, Only I'm, way they... I'm not going to count them out yet, but uh, I'll say Miami is sick, but shoot, they might have to win in seven now because uh, I thought they were going to win yesterday, but um, we'll see. But here's but see here here's my thing. Here's the weird thing about basketball. This is one thing I will say that's weird to me about basketball. Unless you have a freakish night that, you know, guys come out and they shoot the lights out like they did last night in San Antonio, when you look at Miami, you say, Okay, what can Miami really do different? Because in that game in game two, they were actually tied they were actually uh, down one before they went on that 33 to five run. Now they're not going to score going a 33 to five run every night, and obviously, um, you know, Neil, Neil, and Green aren't going to score 60 a night. We know that. But which team do you feel more confident about that can consistently get it done? Because you can see that we want to choose, we, we pick and choose when we want to use the weight injury, okay? Which I'm not going to discredit as being a factor. I know it's a factor. I legitimately, I validate the fact that Wade is hurt. I do. But you can't use that when you want to use it 
as if to validate LeBron not getting any help or to, to invalidate when somebody says LeBron's getting no help and then you say, well, you know, Wade's hurt. That's the first thing people out of their mouth. That's the first thing people say when I say Wade is hurt. I mean, when I say LeBron's getting no help. They don't even mention Chris Bosh. They say nothing about Bosh. The first thing they say is Wade's hurt. The injury's nagging him. He's been, well, you know, he's been injured, and he's been, okay. But that doesn't change the fact that LeBron's getting no help. I'm not saying Wade's doing it on purpose. <laughs> I'm just saying he's not getting any help. Ray Allen has been almost non-existent. I mean, you know, I, I just the, the 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 construction of these the, these these you know big money maker sort of uh, fancy uh, you know we're gonna yeah you know we're gonna all come together and the Beatles and we're gonna play you know I hope that's dead. I really do. I hope it's dead. I really really do because I'm so tired of this phony pressure that the media puts on these teams uh, to win, you know, where a guy like LeBron is saying, oh, I need to do more. You were the MVP this year. You're the defending finals MVP. You were the defending champion. You came in with a formula. You had a triple-double with 18 rebounds, and you guys won. That's the formula. Stick with what got you there. Don't go out and try to be Michael Jordan. Because the media thinks, and Stephen A. Smith think you're not doing enough. Or so-and-so thinks you've got to be more aggressive, and Magic Johnson and all that. Stop. Stop listening to analysts. That's one of the things I don't like about LeBron James. His skin is thin, and he listens to everything the media says, and he tries to go out, and he tries to be this, you know, please everybody type player. That's one of the things I love about Kobe Bryant. Kobe don't give a damn about the media, and he'll tell you. I hate you guys. You know what I'm saying? My man Roy Hibbert <laughs> hates the media. And I love guys like that. I love guys who just hate the media and they're like, you know what? I'm going to go out and do stick with what got us there. Because cha- that's what champions do. You don't see Tony Parker going out there trying to do too much or overdoing it. Ginobili. Uh... Uh, even Tim Duncan. So, you know, again, I, I still, like I said, I still say San Antonio in six. I think Miami's good enough to get one more. Um, all be, I do think, I do believe that, um, you know, obviously they're going to have to get one of these on the road. It just, it is what it is. They're going to have to get one on the road. I think they're good enough to get one on the road, but. Uh, they never win game four. Yeah, tough call, tough call. We'll we'll see, we'll we'll see. But uh, anyway, you know, let's let's move on to the next topic. Um, I know that the NBA will sort of sort of play itself out, and and we'll have a better idea of things to you know obviously next week. Either it'll be a series that'll be a done one, uh, you know, over over and finished, or you know we'll be talking, we'll be singing a different tune. Couple of couple of NFL stories this week. Number one, Chad Johnson. Um, I'm not really going to touch it because I think there's a large racial component to it, and I know that some people may listen to this and be like, no, racial t- component with you, John? No way. But yeah, I, I really do. I think it was total grandstanding by a judge. I think it was total. You know, I'm gonna put that boy in his place. I, it was a lot of placism there, and I didn't like it. You're talking about a guy who, me and you agree, statistically is one of the top receivers in the NFL the last 10 years, doesn't have a job. A lot of that is his fault. I'm not going front. Stay away from the reality shows. Stay away from the social media. And, yes, damn it, stay off that damn Twitter. But that does not mean that he can't play. Because on the flip side of that, we see a guy who's proven absolutely nothing as if now a play, one playoff win against a depleted Steelers team means something. Two years ago, we see the, the hype and the hoopla around this guy going to New England. You summed it up best when you said, it makes it look like he's better than he is. 
And I was like, damn, my man Adam is real smart because that's exactly what I said. Forget about the white privilege thing. Forget about the whole, you know, if I told you that he was 46% from the field, um, a 46% passer, he's a terrible practice player, and oh, by the way, he's only three games over 500 as a starter. If I told you that was a black quarterback, you'd say, damn, where is he selling used cars? Because you sure as hell would not think he's getting an opportunity in the NFL. The guy was ranked dead last in the NFL in passes over 10 yards. How in the hell can you not throw a pass? Ten, I can throw a pass 10 yards. And it's just frustrating because all that is is placism. Placism. Brother's got to know his place. This guy over here who can really play, we're going to just accentuate and highlight some of the knucklehead stuff he does. We're going to overlook what this guy over here does on the field because he has the right look. He has the right appeal. He may even have the right religion or be married to the right girl. It's placism. The double standard, as Don King used to call it, the great boxing manager, the double standard. And I'm just tired of the double standard in sports. This guy did absolutely nothing to earn his place in the NFL as far as on the field. He did not win the job in Denver. Let us be clear about that. Let's address that one right off the bat. He didn't win the job in Denver. He got the job through the court of public opinion. Yes, Kyle Orton was one and four. And yes, Kyle Orton came back that very same season and beat you at home, one of your three-in-a-row losses. That should have knocked Denver out of the playoffs had the Raiders taken care of their business. So I don't want to hear this, he won the AFC West championship. No, he didn't. They got the AFC West championship on default. Three embarrassing losses in a row. They lost to Kyle Orton. They didn't even score a touchdown in that game. So this guy won the job on popularity. You go to New York. Here's what kills me. I got off the phone with a guy yesterday who gave me the round and round and round about, yeah, he deserves an opportunity. The Jets mishandled him and the Jets this and that. Really, all they told him was he'd have a chance to come in and compete for the starting job. Now, if you know a guy is 46% passing and he's a bad practice player, why is nobody, like, saying, oh, I get it. If you're that sorry in practice that you can't beat out Mark freaking Sanchez, I don't want to hear about how much opportunity this guy has been shafted on. The Jets know it. The Jets were eager to get rid of him. They know he can't play on the level you need to play. Again, if I told you, give me a, give me a black quarterback, backup or otherwise, that has passed for 46% in, his, in any given season, 46% as a starter and is a bad practice player. We talking about practice. <laughs> we talking about practice. Allen Iverson was a Hall of Famer, and you choose to try to attach practice to his legacy as if it means everything. But yet this guy gets to skate in practice? I mean, this has got really – This is it's really – really sexing to me because all it is when I look at a guy like a Tim Tebow and I still see guys out there like a Terrell Owens. Terrell Owens, the guy, the guy took his shirt off. He looked like he was carved out of wood. The guy keeps himself in fantastic shape. That guy can't help a team? I mean, Frisco had to bite their lip to sign Randy Moss, and that guy's a Hall of Famer. So I'm tired of the double standard in sports because it makes it look like – now, listen, to be fair, to be fair to the New England Patriots, let's be fair and let's be honest. That's what they do. They give guys opportunities. They give guys shots. They do. Let's be fair. They gave Albert Haynesworth a shot. A lot of people thought Albert Haynesworth was a pile of crap. 
they gave Chad a shot. I don't think they gave him – say again? Corey Dillon. Corey Dillon. They got a ring. Corey Dillon got a ring. And Corey Dillon was kind of a knucklehead. So let's face it, to their credit, they do they are out there for giving the guys a shot. I understand that. I understand that. So some people will say, well maybe well then they'll say, Well, John, what what are you talking about then? Well, why are you saying that Tim doesn't deserve an opportunity? Because unlike him, those guys were all extremely successful at their positions prior to joining. Corey Dillon was already a thousand yard a year a thousand yard rusher guy. Albert Haynesworth was a super beast. Albert Hainsworth was one of the most feared defensive linemen in the NFL. Chad Johnson, you know, he's one of only a handful of active players over 10,000 yards receiving for his career. These guys have all put in, like, major, major, major veteran work. We're not talking about a guy who, you know, won six out of seven games, then dropped the last three out of the season and passes for 46%. We're not talking about that guy. That guy's earned nothing. That guy went to the Jets, and people are talking about, well, he, he never got a chance with the Jets. 71 offensive plays he got last year. 71 offensive plays out of 16 games. You do the math. That's a little over five plays, a little over four plays a game. 53 times he lined up under center as a quarterback. How many touchdowns did he have? Zero. I don't know where – I don't know – how much the Jets were supposed to bend over backwards for this guy. They flew him in on a private jet. He did a press conference. He's a backup quarterback. And the thing that sucks about it is this year, New England is going to have some success. And they're going to try to attach some of that to Tebow as if he has something to do with it. Us bringing him in here made us this better team. BS, man. Yes, you're. I'm sorry to go off on a rant, but I just I'm tired of the double standard in sports. I'm just I'm tired of it. We'll get to baseball in a minute and how violence has somehow become accepted in brawling in baseball because we know it's the sideshow in hockey. But but we'll get to we'll get to that in a minute. But your thoughts, man, on, on the whole Tebow situation? Yeah, I think uh, you know it's gonna be interesting to see uh, what um, what they do with him. Um, you know, no doubt Brady's the guy there, and I'm, I'm I'm pretty sure they told him that once he, you know, got there and, you know, they dealt with the contract and things. But, um, you know, maybe they use him in some wildcat. Maybe they use him in a couple of trick plays. Maybe they have a couple of plays where, uh, you know, him and Brady are on the field at the same time. But it's all gimmick stuff. Uh, he's not going to get credit for wins, you know, uh, uh, Brady's going to get credit for the wins, but um, but then but then let me let me ask you that not to, not to cut your wisdom, not to cut your wisdom. But let me ask you this though: if that's the case, and we know he's not going to get credit here, we know he's not going to be the starter here, we know he's not even going to be the backup here, and he may get very little time and gimmicky plays. How is that any different than what went on in the Jets? Uh, he's with a better team, I guess. I mean, I don't know. I mean, he has a better chance to get a Super Bowl ring, but that's about it. Right, but 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 again, what I'm saying though is 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 is, is my point is is somewhat rhetorical, in the sense that if you're saying that the only thing that's different here is that he's going to a better team, then that totally validates our point of it's almost trying to make him look better than he really is. Like he somehow earned his trip to New England because he's going to be used in the same capacity that he was used in with the Jets. So how is that any different, Tebow fan? How is that any different than what he just went through? And at what point are you going to say, hmm, maybe it is him? There's an old saying, if you run into jackasses once every so often, you maybe just are running into jackasses. But if you run into jackasses all the time, maybe you're the jackass. In other words, my point is, is if his, if his success is contingent upon the team he goes to 
as opposed to his own personal development and skill, then I don't see how he keeps getting the opportunity because we look at his uh, his we look at his personal ability and we look at his own personal talent and guess what? I didn't see an improvement. You didn't even play last year. I don't want to hear about Rex Ryan's ego kept you out of the you know, somebody had the nerve to tell me that. Was well, Rex Ryan's ego wanna really, wanna really Rex Ryan's ego that kept Tim Tebow from playing. I think it's more performance. More performance than You know the NFL is a performance league. NFL is the hardest league. Look, less than one percent of all college football players make the NFL are drafted. Less than one percent. It is probably the toughest sport out there to make. Those guys, man, they're trying to eat. Those guys are trying to play. They are not on no ego trip. Uh, they are not on no, no, uh, um, you know, it's all for show and trying to high sign. These guys are trying to eat, and they're trying to make the squad. These guys are trying to make the team. And there has got to be something that the Jets saw in him. There's got to be the, something the Jets know about his intangibles, that the game is more than just when the lights come on. Well, when you turn the game lights on, Tebow goes to work and yada, yada, yada. But, yeah, but why don't you quote the, the funny, one of the funniest guys, analysts that contradict, and I love him to death, Herm Edwards, he has a real contradictory statement when it, when it comes to guys who are good players on the field but they're terrible practice players. He says, look, you're going to practice more than you ever play. You don't practice football ten times the amount that you play. So if you know that, how are you behind a guy who is a bad practice player? But this is what I'm saying about placism has made Tebow sort of this superficial figure to the media and to people who are on his team and sort of, sort of made it acceptable to be mediocre when it comes to this guy. Stephen A. Smith made a great point this morning. He said, he said Vince Young won 31 games as a starter, 31. He said if, they, if New England signed Vince Young, would there have been a media circus around them? No. Hell no. There wouldn't have been the media hoopla around them. He used another example. He said Donovan McNabb. He said if McNabb was signed by the New England Patriots, do you think it would have been the media circus and the media hoopla? No. And I would argue to you and anybody else who's listening that the only time we see these media circuses is when we know that the person is of either questionable skill or questionable character. Good guys don't get followed around. It's the Lindsay Lohans and the Kim Kardashians of the world, the train wrecks that get followed around. So people can say that, you know, I'm hating on Tim Tebow, and that's all good and fine. That's, that's, that's fair. That's your point. That's your point, and that's great. I disagree with it because I'm just saying – I'm not upset because he's getting the opportunity. I'm upset because it's just clear he hasn't earned the opportunity. We all know it. It's like when you, you, you're, you know, you, the, the, the guy, you work at a job and you're, well, how did he get the job? Well, his brother-in-law is the manager. It's just, we all know it. It's like, I mean, Tebow fans, come, come off of it. Stop, stop. You know, some guy pitched to me yesterday, well, you know, he, uh, he, he won a playoff game, and he has the same amount of wins as Tony Romo uh, in the playoffs. Okay, does he have the same amount of wins as Tony Romo? No. The rating is Tony Romo? No. Is Romo a Hall of Famer? No, he's absolutely not. But he's a legitimate starting quarterback. Is he a $100 million guy? Different topic for a different show. I don't think he is. However... He is an NFL starting quarterback. So I don't want to hear about, you know, you, you, you trying to pigeonhole and pinpoint down when you feel it's important to, you know, to talk about 
him getting an opportunity and his lack of opportunity, the guy was Mr. Everything at Florida. The guy won two national championships. The guy won a Heisman Trophy and was up for a second. That guy has never had any opportunity. You brought that great point up before where it's like, how is everybody saying that this guy has never been nurtured and cultured? This guy has been on a pedestal since he was in college. This guy has had every opportunity imaginable. Jets don't owe him nothing. Hell, he shouldn't have, brought, he shouldn't have took his ass to uh, New York. He should have went to Jacksonville. He should have went to a small market team like Jacksonville. You already own the keys to Florida. <laughs> you should have went to a small market team like that. He's, uh, that he's way, from, the, he, he, he's from. Uh, well, I don't know if he's from Jacksonville, but he's he's closer to Jacksonville as far as his hometown. So yeah, that would have been the perfect scenario. Long perfect man, scenario. Man, you know. And you know he would. You know he would have beat out. It would have helped their attendance, no doubt. It would have helped their attendance. <laughs> It would have bought their attendance sales, ticket sales, jersey sales, everything. But it the franchise. Not only that, not only that, but oh, by the way, you would have beat, you would have got significant playing time with Blaine Gabbert. Yeah, <laughs> Blaine, yeah, Blaine, mean, yeah. uh, let's say, let's say, hey, you bring in, you know, you at least get that team to the playoffs. Hey, that makes you look even better. Absolutely. That's what I said. I was. That's what I was talking about yesterday. You can discredit, discount, dis, you know, uh, disapprove of all you want to of that defense that they had. Dawkins, Champ Bailey still playing well. Von Miller and Elvis Dumerville, two of the best defensive ends. Von Miller was up for Defensive Player of the Year award this year. That's how good he was. He is. So I don't want to hear that that defense is nothing. Willis McGay, he ran his ass off. All that other stuff. You can discredit all that and give all the credit to Tim Tebow if you want to. But the bottom line is, is if you go to New York and you cannot beat out Mark Sanchez for a starting position, I do not want to hear about ego. I do not want to hear about uh, uh, Rex Ryan prevented him from having this. And No. Placism, man. Placism. We go. We go. Place this guy here because it benefits our narrative. We go. Place this guy there because it looks better for us. When that coach from Miami came in and cut Jet, Chad Johnson for some stuff that happened off the field, that's called placism. I'm going to make this guy the example because this guy is already kind of hated by the media. This guy's kind of unaccepted. But a guy who has clearly shown within the last calendar year no sort of improvement on the field whatsoever, we don't criticize any and everybody around this guy because he's not getting his opportunity. It's amazing, man. It's it's just it's it's really amazing to me. It's amazing to me because that feeds kind of right into our next topic of of, of baseball. <laughs> I, I'm I I give man. I don't know which way your sport is going. I personally do not think they have recovered from the steroid era. Um, I think that there's a there's a feel good story every now and again, every here and here and there. Um, I think brawls are an embarrassment in baseball. You're talking about a a very um, kid-friendly sport, you know, one that you you bring the kids out. It's a summertime sport. It's a feel-good sport. I would argue with some people that basketball has um, uh, has surpassed baseball as a national pastime. What's, what's, what's going on with your sport, man? What's, what's, up with the, what's up with the brawling? What's up with the fighting? And then they don't even swing. Uh, well, what happened was, uh, you know, you know, you still Puig, he's, you know, the hot shot rookie, you know, for the Dodgers. And, you know, he's been, uh, you know, tearing it up. And uh, what it is is uh, a lot of his uh, hits have come because he, died. he dives across the plate. You know, guys haven't really been coming inside on him. And, uh, you know, Kennedy, 
for some odd reason he wanted to come inside, but he came up and in, which, you know, if you want to try to send a message, you don't come up and in because you can end up hurting somebody. Maybe, you know, you throw inside more hip, you know, to the hip or, or lower, you know, and then uh, go from there. But, um, you know, he, he tried, I don't know if he tried to send a message or he just tried to back, back him off off the plate. Because if you don't have the outside corner as a pitcher, then you, uh, you don't, you're not going to, uh, be successful because you got to have both sides of the plate. But a lot of young guys, a lot of these young pitchers, they just don't know how to pitch inside effectively. That's why guys end up getting hit. Now, you know, he gets hit, Granky retaliates, and then Kennedy hits Granky, and then, hey, you know, it all broke loose from there because, you know, the retaliation was already settled, and then, you know, Kennedy had to go back and hit Granky. So, and then, uh, you know, it's crazy because the coaches got into it. You know, they wanted to go scrap, scrap at each other, and uh, you know, it's, do you think that do you think that brawls have be do you think that brawls have become accepted in baseball? Uh, do you think that they're on the Do you think that they're on their way? Because I mean, I'm uh, I'm not against I'm not against I don't think it'll ever get to hockey. I don't think it'll ever get to that extent at all. Because well, I mean, I mean, I'm I'm saying no, I I agree, but I'm saying from a standpoint of from a standpoint of I'm for you know brush a guy off, brush him back. That's your job. You as a pitcher, in my opinion, should feel like that is your plate and, you know, get off of it. So I agree with that. But what I'm saying is, do you think that baseball is becoming sort of acceptance of these sort of altercations? Because we're starting to get a lot of press for these altercations as opposed to what guys are doing on the field. I mean, what happened to, you know, the rookie, you know, sensations that were supposed to come, Strasburg? What happened to Harper? What happened to Hayward? You know, and a lot of these guys that were supposed to be the next generation of, you know, great baseball players um, that, you know, all of a sudden, just out of the blue, something like a brawl can sort of overtake, you know, the good that these guys are trying to do. Look, when baseball start cracking down on people for the steroids, and this is just my opinion. When baseball start cracking down on people for the steroids, it seemed like everybody that you wanted to confess didn't or you couldn't catch or you couldn't get, and everybody that you seemed to not care about or give a pass to that did confess, you chose not to make them the example. I mean, Rafael Palmero kind of disappears in the obscurity Mark McGuire goes off and gets a cushy hitting coach job with St. Louis. Um, you know, Sammy Sosa all of a sudden can't speak English. Um, you know what I'm saying? So it's 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 kind of like it's kind of like baseball to me is a sport that just keeps like shooting itself in the foot. And I just really hope that these brawls don't become routine because I think they're bad for the sport, man. I think they're really bad for the sport. Because baseball, to me, it's a gentleman's sport. I think it's a I think it's a classy sport. It's a sport where it's a it's a sport of skill and precision. It, we're not beating each other over the head. We're not we're not you know it's not we're not tackling people. It's a, it's a sport of, that's supposed to have a little bit of class about it. And I'm just not seeing it. I'm not seeing it. I don't know what the I don't know what the answer is. I don't know what you know they can do to curb it. I think their commissioners you know needs to crack down. You know I think the, the, yeah, the yeah. penalty. Yeah, I mean there's going to be there's, there's, there's going to be suspensions, no doubt. Yeah, but then look and he, and then and look and then here's the flip side of that coin. Here's the here's the other flip side of that coin. They don't even really box. I mean. <laughs> He ran out there and, like, shoulder blocked this dude. I'm like, what are you – I think I've seen, like, five cats in baseball, like, like box. Nolan Ryan was one of them. Nolan Ryan, he would box. He scrapped. But a lot of these cats, man, they go out there and it's like, I want to do, like, this wrestling move on you. I mean, what, what are you doing? They need to start taking 
Dude. <laughs> I'm just kidding, man. I'm not condoning boxing in the sport. I'm really not. But all I think I'm saying is, I say that to, in all honesty to say this. I think that if your intent is you're going to run out there and try to block a guy, you don't really want to fight. So if you don't really want to fight, the hell are you doing running out there? So, you know, again, that's just that's just my perspective on it. And I just I just hope baseball can make a recovery because let's face it, there still isn't really anything decent to watch during the summer. And you get a lot of good there are a lot of good rivalries in baseball. The Yankees Red Sox rivalry, it's dead, but it's still a name rivalry. When you see that on paper, you, you still your ears are gonna prick up. You'll watch it. You know the West Coast rivalry, Giants and Dodgers. That's still an interesting one. You know Giants won a championship. Dodgers, you know they just got bought for two billion dollars. You know there's a lot of good storylines out there, man. And I just I just wish that they would um, really you know trying to put the game first. You know as opposed to all this little side they're doing, but. I guess that's another topic for another show. But we are kind of up against it, man, so we're going to go out here and get out of here. Did you have anything uh, left on your plate? Uh, no, just uh, pretty much uh, NBA season coming to the towards the end. And, uh, yeah, all we're going to really have is a little bit of uh, tennis here and there. Some, you know, um, a uh, little bit of golf and baseball throughout the summer. So, um, hey, why not come out to the ballpark, watch a game? Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, it's definitely, you know, get out, get some sun, get get some air. You know, summer's coming. You know, why not? So you might see Adam up there. You know, you might always see Adam up there. Adam, he stays in the <laughs> stadium. You know that, man. I know how it is. But anyway, we get out of here, man. I appreciate you each and every week coming in here with me. Me coming in here with you, and it is what it is. But uh, next week, obviously, we'll be one step closer to a uh, Larry O'Brien Trophy winner. We'll have some more insight. We'll have a new U.S. Open winner, or one that we've obviously seen before. Who knows? And um, you know some other fun facts and tidbits that we know you all find interesting tips recipes comments ideas stacy sports.com the boys courtesy of the table five courtesy of the sports bar I should say each and every week you know suggestions ideas you got a topic you want to talk about something on your mind you know what i'm saying we could be sort of the sort of the ghetto dr phil me and my man adam dr phil <laughs> <laughs> Showtime at the Apollo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Showtime at the Apollo. Something like that, you know. We just, you know, we try to do more listening than we do talking, you know. And and so we get a lot of tips here and there. And, you know, why don't you guys talk about this? Why don't you guys talk about that? So, you know, don't be shy. Leave your comment. You know, tell us we're crazy. Tell us we're off the reservation, whatever. But, um, you know, check in. So that's it. I appreciate you, my man. Out of here. Um, Catch you next week.
Thank you.